Um, so today I'm just going to talk about what the Lord gave me this phrase, my father is my truth compass. And I would say that that works um, both on the positive and the negative side, right? And if we use the word father to mean who am I following, so I grew up in inner city and I, my father left my mother and I never met him, then somebody's going to try to father me out on the streets. And often it's gangs, right? And we have several people uh, that are part of our fellowship that, that were in that situation. And you, if you go out alone, it's going to be way more dangerous than if you join a gang because it might be, you know, it might have some bad intentions, but at least you have some protection. And you do what you have to do to survive. And you don't say, well, I wouldn't have done that if I were there because you have no idea what you would have done if you were there. So we want to recognize that as Christians, we serve a God who calls himself Father. And there's a spirit of adoption that cries out, Abba, Father. So there's an intimacy level there that most people would not have connected with, with God. Whatever their impression of God was in the Old Testament, Father wasn't one of them. Judge, yes. Angry, yes. Does that still happen? I'm getting some stares. Thank you. Who's ever awake over here? It does. Still happens. God's angry. He wants to punish you. Stay under the radar. Don't sing too loud in church. You might wake him up. That's not our philosophy. You might have seen, hopefully. Wait a minute. He loves me. He wants to be with me. I was created to worship him. And look, I don't mean, again, to sound critical of other ways churches hold service, but it should be relational. He's a father. He loves you. And sometimes we'll get mixed up and we'll put our earthly father in there, but that's not right, right? Like, not the bad parts anyway. The good parts, sure, but God's a good father, and he loves us. So who's ever fathering you, whether it's your earthly father or not, they have a big influence on your life. And we better recognize that those are the rules of engagement in the kingdom. Is it fair? No. Was it fair in the garden? Yes. Once they sinned in the garden, things became unfair. But we have weapons that we have to access in order to win this battle that we've been talking about already today. Whether it's the political uh, cor well, corruption, that was a, it's always been a big topic around here. But each time we have to look through the kingdom lens to see how to solve an earthly problem. If you've been a father, you know how difficult it is because you're trying to juggle so many things. And often when you have the least amount of time is when your children are little because you're working so hard to provide for them, but that's the time they need you the most. <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to talk about the positive things now because you're in the family of God. And we call each other brother and sister for a reason, don't we? Because it's family. And when people in the early New Testament, when they got saved, their families often just had wanted nothing to do with them anymore. So they literally were moving to a new family. And we need each other, right? If COVID didn't teach us that, we need each other. Call each other up, pray for one another. You're helping them one day, they're going to be helping you the next day. And that's what koinonia means. That's what this tribal effect of being together with like-minded, full of faith people, that when you're sick, they're not going to say, well, maybe God's trying to teach you a lesson with this sickness. Well, yeah, maybe you hear that out there, but you won't hear that here because we don't believe that. We, we, that's not a good father. You'd have to call Dyphus on God. Well, let me teach you about the fire. You just put his hand on a lit stove. No. No. That's, that's, not, that's crazy. God does use things that we do wrong to teach us things, but it's not his intention to do that. He loves us. When you love somebody, you give them room to make mistakes, and then you help them recognize what they did wrong and grow. So anyway, I don't want to get too sidetracked. The, the text verse I'm using is from John 5, 19. My father, my truth compass. Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. When I was a new Christian, I wasn't, that verse wasn't pointed out to me too early on. I wish it was, because... This is that idea of a truth compass in our life. Jesus is saying, I am single-minded in my obedience. If I only do, I can't do anything on myself, I only do what I see my Father doing. And how many of our problems would be solved if we lived by that same motto? And it's Scripture. He's our model. Jesus is the one we aspire to be like, the perfect human who came. 
even though the culture wouldn't say that. And he's also the most brilliant human that ever lived, even though the culture thinks Einstein might have that role or somebody else. Not Snooky, I don't think. But Jesus was brilliant. And yet we see him as this ethereal, kind of flaky guy that wasn't tuned in. And you'll hear people, when you, when you witness the people in the business world, they'll say things like, oh, well, I live in the real world. Church is not the real world. Oh, really? That's because you've been there and you know, right? This is more real than what's out there. Because you got a lot more help in this room when you're together with other believers than all of the spirits that are flying around in the subways in New York. Go with somebody else. I'm telling you, people like my wife that have a real strong discerning and they see spirits, it can be like overload. Like, where do I start? Rough, but that's where the light belongs in the darkness. That's what we're here for, to be models of what the Father would do. When we make a mistake, he doesn't condemn us. He picks us back up again. When you learned how to ride your bike, you didn't get it right the first time, right? Maybe when you had the training wheels on. But when they took the training wheels off, you ended up in a bush. <laughs> she didn't know how to stop the thing. Did your father yell at you for that? Or your mother, whoever was, no, that's what happens. You got to make a couple of mistakes along the way. And boy, that bush will teach you, you better learn how to use the brakes. We started thinking in this country that if we overprotect people and we bubble wrap them, we'll be helping them. Oh, they can't fall in the bush. Well, yeah, no, that's the part of life is when you learn, you're going to make some mistakes, but we can't bubble wrap you to make you stronger. You have to be exposed to some challenges. <clears throat> The son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. And whatever the father does, the son also does in like manner. So if you're not sure if something's a sin or not, this could be one little test you could give yourself. Do you think Jesus ever saw the father doing this? Fill in the blank. Getting drunk at a wedding. <laughs> but it's a party. It's a celebration. I'm not preaching against having a drink, but 15 is probably too many. And the Bible specifically says being drunk is a sin. Is this hard to understand why being drunk is a sin? When they name the liquor store Spirits Unlimited, that should give you a little bit of a clue. And it's a chain of stores. So they got links all over to this chain. Unlimited spirits. No, I had enough of that, man. I'm trying to keep the Holy Spirit. That's enough. I don't need no unlimited spirits. But then we get legalistic and say, well, you can't have a glass of wine. The wine wasn't really in the Bible when Jesus turned it. He turned it into grape juice. <laughs> Selah. Right, okay. You get my point. You can turn anything into a religion. Your company, whatever you do. You have a sewing club, and that could get religious. Or you could stay open and flow with God and love people and be kind to them and not just give them these standard answers, which is what God is trying to encourage us to stay in an active 24-7, 365, open invitation to talk to you about everything you need. That's what a good father does. I'm just curious, any older uh, parents here that have adult children, when they call you for advice and you believe that they're really asking for advice and not just trying to get to asking you for money, doesn't it light you up when they want to know your opinion about something? Well, why would God be any different? He's like, oh, they get it. I'm, I'm here all the time. Whenever they want, I'll answer whatever they ask. But you have not because? No, well, that's not his fault. So if we want to just get current, Psalm 11.3 says, If the foundations of a godly society are destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's the amplified version. Do you think that might be happening in our culture? But, but does light belong in the darkness? Yes. So this is where we step up. We don't hide from the world. We bring what God gave us into the world, and we become the light. And the darker it gets, the brighter you shine. But not everybody's been taught to think that way. It's like, hurry up, Jesus, come back. Get us out of here. It's a mess down here. Hurry up, swing low, sweet chariot, and get me out of here. Well, maybe we should say, no, Lord, wait another day because some more people are getting saved. Who knows? Who, who, who knows who that next person? But one good answer for this would be, if the foundations of a godly society are destroyed, what can the righteous do? How about call out to God? If my people, 
Say it with me. Who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Purpose to seek my first face. Turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I'll heal their lamp. Well, that's not a bad place to start. That's what Kathy was saying. Five o'clock in the morning, they're having prayer meetings. Well, if the energy's here and the Lord tells us to do that, the doors will be open. And we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Only because he said it, right? Because that's the thing you have to do. You have to be strategic. It says about the sons of Issachar, they knew the times and the seasons, and they knew what to do. Knowing the times and seasons isn't enough. You've got to hear God's voice in there weaving you through. And sometimes the obvious thing is not the God obvious thing. Psalm 73, this helps me a lot. I go back to this verse. I don't know if you know the structure of the Psalms, but this is the first Psalm that was not uh, part of David's hymnal. And, and boy, it's powerful in the Passion Translation. And I won't go into all the detail, but basically the Psalm is the same one. I tried to understand. We could use today's culture as an example. Supreme Court Justice is a woman. Can you give us a definition of a woman? No, I'm not a biologist. Like if that's not too confusing, like, I don't know what is. And it didn't disqualify her. I think that would have been the most shocking thing to my dad. I had an aunt that was going to go into a nursing home, and they were giving her these tests, and she was with my cousin, uh, you know, her son. And the doctor came in, and how are you? What's your name? What's your age? Do you know who the president of the United States is? And my aunt looked at her son and said, this guy's a doctor, and he doesn't know who the president is? I don't want to go here. I'm not going to live here. <laughs> See what happens? Like, you know, gets too confusing. And we're trying to process all this stuff. I want to understand it, but it was too puzzling to me, too much of a riddle to me. But then one day I was brought into the sanctuaries of God. And that doesn't mean just church service, okay? I hope you get that. It should mean church service, but it doesn't always. Sometimes the church service doesn't always feel like the sanctuary of God. I hope not here, but whatever. You know, it could happen. It does, not a guarantee. You can't manufacture the presence of God. No formula, no algorithm. It's just obedience and loving him and coming together. And he says, if you're gathered in my name, I'm going to be there with you. Yeah. Wow. Just two people. It's all he needs to show up. So it should be there. But this person understands when I'm in confusion, and then I, one day I was brought into the sanctuaries of God, and in the light of glory, my distorted perspective vanished. Who could use that right now? How many distorted perspectives are going on? So when I said about Point Pleasant, this is what I'm talking about. In the light of glory, when all these people were worshiping, there was an amplification, like the psalmist said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And watch the magnifying that happens. And people step into a zone of anointing. And all of a sudden, boom, my distorted perspective vanished. And I could see clearly that someone was trying to take advantage of me. Or, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is. And then Matthew, in Matthew 7, 24, he gives us awesome examples. That's the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7. And this is near the end. Everyone who hears my teaching and applies it to his life. Okay? Not just gets a good grade in Sunday school and understands the scripture and can answer the right questions in Sunday school, as good as that is. But if you never build the bridge to the real world, right? The real world, Mercedes-Benz mechanics in New York City, or is it BMW? BMW, sorry. All right, well, you know, like quoting him Acts chapter 3 might not help. He wants, he wants a real answer for the real world, but you can weave in Scripture everywhere. All the truth of the Word of God always works in every situation. If you'll ask the Lord, how do I do it? So he said, everyone who hears my teaching and applies it, that's, that's the key, applies it to his life, can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. Who wants that? Oh, yeah, because when the rains fell and the flood came with fierce winds, beating upon his house, it stood because of its firm foundation. Remember that song we sang? Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my trust in Jesus. He never let me down. Man, can't stop singing that one. 
So then in the, in the voice in Hebrews 12, it says, the one whose voice in earlier times shook the earth now makes another promise. Yet once more, I will shake not only the hev- earth, but also the heavens. All right, do you think that's a bad thing? No, because if your house is built on the rock, you're not afraid of the shaking. In fact, you might even look forward to it. That sounds funny. I know it might sound funny. But sometimes the shaking is what wakes people up to their need that they have. They didn't think they needed God until they felt the fear of COVID. And then family members wouldn't invite them to a, a, a Thanksgiving service. Whatever it is, who knows? There's a million ways it... You, you saw what COVID did was expose things in people that you didn't know were there. And that doesn't make them bad people. It just means they're human beings and they have flaws. And we all, you know, the Bible says that we're cracked vessels. So that's okay. What are you going to do with it? Call them out on it or give them a better answer? That's our job is to show them a better way. Stay cool under pressure because God's in control. Anyway, I'm going to keep going. He said, I'm going to once more shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Therefore, let us be thankful that we are part, say it with me, of an unshakable kingdom. I am part, say it, of an unshakable kingdom when my feet are on the rock, not on the sinking sand. And that might be an easy way to introduce this topic to a co-worker or something. And I'm guessing most of you have co-workers like I do. Well, I'm, I'm in a Christian company now, but when I was not in a Christian company, um, they would just come and ask for advice. And they would never say, you know, what does the Bible say about this? But they knew that I had been willing to give advice before that had worked for them. This is normal, right? It should be normal. If we're using this book as the guideline, then we're going to be given good advice. And they wouldn't openly say anything. In fact, they would drop F-bombs often in, in my office. <laughs> What are you going to do? Like, oh, get out of here. You defiled me. (laughs) They don't know any better. I didn't know any better when I first got saved. I didn't even realize I was doing it half the time. So don't be too religious to be a light. Anyway, I'm not not advancing the idea of F-bombs, okay? I'm just saying, they don't know any better. They'll change. You don't clean them up and then bring them in. You bring them in when they're a mess. (laughs) That was me for sure. We're part of an unshakable kingdom, and we offer up to God worship that pleases him and reflects the awe and the reverence that we have towards him. Don't you find it's very humbling to be a Christian? That, that often, like, but God, like, if, if I hadn't gotten saved, where would I be right now? I don't even want to think about it. And then when you try to solve a problem and you don't get it exactly right, you say, oh, man, I should know better. Well, okay, but don't do that. The enemy is going to stand there and keep accusing you. And shut that voice off and say, God didn't kick me out because I didn't get a perfect score on that test. I want to learn from it. I don't want to change. I don't want to ask my friends to hold me accountable to whatever that thing was. You can't ask for help if you don't think you have a problem, right? Amen? Oh, thank you. (laughs) John 18, so, says Pilate. I'm sure a lot of you know this scene. Getting near the end of John's gospel, and he's been already brought before Pilate to go on trial and says, oh, you're a king, are you? And Jesus says, you're calling me a king. I was born for this. I've come into the world for this, to give evidence about the truth. I think a lot of us would have thought he came to save the world of our sins and to resurrect, but Part of what his mission is, he says right here, it's why he came, to give evidence about the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And we all know what Pilate said. What's that? What's truth? It's what the world is saying today. It's your version of truth. And and it may work for you, but you can't put your truth on me. And God's saying, no, I have a truth compass. (laughs) You follow my truth compass, you're going to end up way better off. Doesn't mean your life will be easy. But you'll, by pleasing the Father, the blessing comes. By being obedient, the blessing comes. And we can just get real honest for a minute. It says, you know, uh, Peter in the book of Acts quotes the verse I already mentioned in Psalm chapter 2, why did the heathen rage? Well, m- people don't like having limits. And the enemy, the devil, the reason he got kicked out of heaven was pride. And why did God say, don't eat of that tree? of the knowledge of good and evil. Because you think you can handle it, but you can't. And we keep proving that every century. 
that we can't handle it. We go too far. We think more of ourselves than we should. And we forget that we need God. If we, if we had been in perfect communion with the Father all along, then he's going to be supplying it for us. But once we cut it off and we thought... There's no difference between a boy and a girl biologically. There's no reason I shouldn't have as much sex with as many people and as many genders as I want. Who are you to tell me that? Well, I'm nobody to tell you anything other than it works. And this is the way you would want to build a whole society so that when people are married, they can trust each other. So when they get into an argument and a fight, they don't bail on each other. So those children have people at home that, that they know love each other, even though they're not perfect people. And I don't mean, I mean to step on anybody's toes right now. This is a hard thing to do. But you wonder, why would God be so restrictive around our sexual behavior? It's because that's what's best for you. But you can't handle the knowledge of good and evil because you don't, not you personally here, but the culture is like, get off my back. Stop telling me how I have to live my life. My body, my choice. Unless it's the vaccine. <laughs> There's a little asterisk there. What happened to my body, my choice? Just a little noble lie. What's a noble lie? You got a, got a scripture verse for that one? I don't think he knew the scripture. But what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pray for Dr. Fauci. Not, get him, Lord. <laughs> pray that he gets a revival in his life. People were looking at me like that, and somebody prayed me in. Amen? Somebody pray you in? Yeah. That's not awesome. So he's not my enemy. So this is what I've come to start saying a lot lately. All truth is inconvenient to someone. Because <laughs> there was a movie out many years ago called Inconvenient Truth. It was about climate change and all. And I, I'm not saying you have to believe what they were saying. But it is a good title. It's an inconvenient truth when you realize what you thought would work is not working. What you thought was a drug deal is really the police. <laughs> and you just got busted. <laughs> what you thought was uh, a little, what? A, a white lie. <laughs> what? Like, it's the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth in you. And we do this, right? We do this, but, but God's there teaching us. You can do it. It's fine, but there's going to be consequences. Just like there's blessing and obedience, there's consequences. And people don't like that fact. And so they create all of these new philosophies, and they'll say there's no such thing as absolute truth. But they just made an absolute statement by saying there's absolutely no absolutes. It's a self-contradicting statement right there. You're going to come up with your own rules because you're so smart that you can outfigure all the thousands of generations that have lived before you. Things that have been proven for generation after generation. Throw it all in the garbage because we have science. That'll do it. Well, science will tell you how things work but not why. And God's the author of science. Hmm. I thought you said you were talking about fathers. Well, look, you know, this is, this is a really profound thing that when you're, when you're disciplining your children, let me just give you some advice. If all you ever say is no, you're going to provoke your children to anger. If there's some yeses in there for real reasons to have a yes, can we go to the park? I'm kind of tired. Yeah, sure, let's go to the park. Right? Like, it's going to be inconvenient for you sometimes. But when they know that your, your goal is yes, as often as you can to keep it healthy, the time that you have to say no, they'll, they'll stop and they'll be, well, I'm not happy, but I know he likes to say yes, so there must be a reason. And it's inconvenient. And, you know, your kid says that they're going to a certain party, and then they get another friend call and say that, oh, I got invited to a better party, so I'm going to cancel on the first one. Anybody remember this? What's the right thing to do? What does the Bible say? Stick to your word. Stick to your word. Even if it hurts, stick to your word. Now, again, that's a general thing. You have to look at the situation. But the point is that there's rules for all, all. There's truth for all situations found in this book. But we're so distracted that we don't spend enough time in it to, to pull it out. And that's that collective captivity that I was talking about. Distraction is the number one way that the devil gets us off. And then it goes to domination, right? It, it just moves very quickly. So this, this is the way I want you to think about it is when you tell people that they can't sleep around, they say you're judging them. <laughs> All right? Well, okay, no, I didn't mean to judge you. But 
you said you wanted to, to be a leader in our church. Well, that's identified as a sin in the Bible. So, you know, that, that would kind of disqualify you for that role. You don't have to stop coming to our church. But if you want to live a good life, you should, you should get married if you're living together. Well, why would I do that? It's just a piece of paper. Well, if it's just a piece of paper, then sign it. <laughs> well, it's not just a piece of paper, is it? So you're lying through your teeth. You, you're getting everything you wanted without having to make a commitment. So why would he do it? Because he knows it's the right thing to do. Because he's got a truth compass. A father who's a truth compass. Some things are taught. Some things are caught. And every one of us here can help out the parents that are in this building and, and the young children that are here and the young people that come for the music events that we hold and all. All of us can be listening ear and not the corrective know-it-all the sage on the stage that's got all the answers. How about guide on the side? How about an arm around the shoulder? Come over to my house. Let's have a barbecue. Let me take you out on the lake. I don't know how to swim. I'm not going to dump you in the water. It's only three feet deep anyway. That's an inside joke. I won't go into it. John 14 Philip says to Jesus, just show us the Father then, Master, and that will be good enough for us. And Jesus says, have I been with you for such a long time, Philip, and you still don't know me? Now, Philip turns into somebody very powerful in the, new, uh, the next phase in the book of Acts. He does amazing miracles. So it's not like he wasn't a man of faith. But Jesus is saying, what do you mean, show you the Father? Have you been with me so long and you still don't know me? Anyone who has seen me... Woo! Try to get your hands around that. Really? This carpenter from this back, backwoods town that nobody even knows about, he's the son of God? He's the exact replication of God? That's hard for people to grasp, isn't it? Well, nothing's too hard for, for God to help us see. Maybe the fact that he was born probably in a cave somewhere, like with the animals, maybe that's good that God didn't bring him into a Hilton because most of us can't afford a Hilton, right? So maybe the fact that God's identifying with all of humanity by coming in right at the lowest rung of the social ladder, rejected right, from the, right off the bat, helps us understand, okay, well, I don't have to have the right resume. I don't have to speak the language a certain way. He's just looking at my heart. That sounds good to me. Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and maybe we should put more time into Gospels, because that's the book that talks about God in the earth. That's real world. Easy? No, not easy. Not easy to bring this into the real world. Worth doing? <laughs> you better believe it. I'm not speaking on my own initiative. Here he goes back to that theme. It's the Father. My Father is the truth compass who lives within me. I have a God-positioning system. Holy Spirit and the Word of God and community of other believers that hold me accountable. That's the formula. Changes every day based on the circumstances, but I have resources available to me. It's the Father who lives within me who's doing his own works through me. Not my will, Lord, but you guys know your Bible. And then I put here, even Scythians? which might not mean much to you, but if you study it out, hopefully you'll understand why I said that. So this is Paul's advice now to the new Christians. And, you know, just like all of us, they're having their own little growing pains trying to figure out how to do this. And he said, don't forget, you've put off the old man with his deeds. When you became Christian, you realize now that dropping the F-bombs and getting drunk and a long list of other things we could say, you don't want to do them anymore. But just not wanting to do them might not be enough. Because if it's just your willpower, you know, you need new friends. You've got to hang out with people that, that are like-minded. It's going to be really hard to go to those old rock and roll concerts, and they're all doing drugs. What are you doing there? You're not in that crowd anymore, unless you're there to witness. Maybe, that, maybe the Lord will bless you that way. But not for me, not right away. I needed to get my, my feet on, on the solid rock first. So I didn't want to put myself where I'd be tempted to backslide, right? So that's just common sense. Put off the old man, but putting off also implies what? <laughs> Thank you. And you put on the new man or woman. 
who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So you're renewed in the, in the image of the creator who's your father. And you're learning how to take on his love in your life. We sang about it this morning. It's not easy, is it? It's not easy to receive the love of God at that intimate, personal level because you're afraid. You've been burned in the past and, and you don't want to be vulnerable again. You want to just live your life, you know, kind of just consigned to the fact that it's not going to get any better. I'm just hoping it doesn't get worse. What could get a whole lot better in here? And when the pump is pure, everything else starts to change after that, right? Where there's not Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. And that's where I pulled this word Scythian from. Easy to just skip over that. But if you ever look at who these people were, they were like the barbarians barbarian. Right? That would have been the roughest crowd that you could imagine, and we could all use examples of that. It says, you're none of those things. You're not separated as a Jew or Greek or circumcised, uncircumcised, male or female, he says in another portion. But... Barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all in all. And this would have been the hardest stretch for them to say, well, maybe my cousin Joe could be a Christian, but not the Scythians, man. I got to draw the line somewhere. And you all have those people in your life, right? You all have Scythians somewhere that you think are just almost too far gone for God, right? Like, who did that? The guy that got eaten by the fish. Remember him? He was given an assignment going to help me out here? Yeah, thank you, Jonah. He's, God tells him to go do something, and he's mad, like, no way, I'm not helping those people. Oh, really? Okay. Well, there's a storm. Any, anybody know why the storm's there? He's like, it's me. Throw me overboard. The storm will stop. <laughs> we don't want to be running away from our assignments, right? And he gets purged up onto the beach. It's like, okay, I'll do it. I don't want to, but I'll do it. <laughs> and then his heart changes. Even that city that looked like it would never change. And we're in the same boat. It takes courage to fight against that tide that's coming against you, but it's not your power. It's his power in you. And that light is beautiful when it shines in the darkness. So he says, Father, you've rescued us. This is a prayer in that same letter of the Colossians. And, and he's helping them to understand that even if you were a Scythian, whatever you consider the lowest rung on the ladder, it doesn't matter to God. That's a very hard thing for people to grasp in modern-day America because we see all kinds of strategy, stratifications of where people live, the kind of house they have, the car they drive, the education level. And we don't even always realize we're doing it. And we walk right past people and don't even think they might have a name or that they're somebody's daughter or it's just like we have horrible things that we say. It's like, wait a minute, no, no. Like if we're really gonna do this and be obedient to the Father, everybody starts on the same level, loved by God. He doesn't want one of them to perish. And sometimes we do. Just one. Just kidding, Nate. We might not say it, but we act like it. And this is probably one of the hardest things for them to grasp because the Jews we're very big about you having to be Jewish and having to follow all the rules. And the whole structure was about how well you followed the rules. But the people who were the most afraid were the ones who followed the rules the most. It's not a good model. It's not good to be driven by fear. It's good to be driven by love. Right? I already said that's what a good father does. He doesn't, I mean, there might be times that you're afraid, but the, the goal is to respect him. Right? Not to have you live in fear. You can't last. It's got to be love. So you rescued us from darkness and brought us safely into the kingdom of your son, whom you love and in whom we are redeemed and forgiven our sins through his blood. Isn't that an awesome outcome? Jesus is the exact image of the invisible God. Man, if you need a truth compass, here we go. It's Jesus. He's the exact image. The invisible God became visible in Jesus and lived his life perfectly before us. I'm you're, I'll say it, for the rest of your life, you'll, you'll find more and more layers of how this is true if you really press in and make it your priority. It was by him that everything was created, the heavens, the earth, all things within and upon them. Not even every Christian believes this. Never mind the people in the world going to believe this. But, but we throw the Bible in the back seat like it's just another book sometimes. Be careful. Reverence this book. That's the key of life right there. But reverence the fact that people are watching us that say we're Christians. And let's try to live in a way that models this. 
not no dichotomy. All things seen. This is Jesus now. All things seen were made by him. Thrones, dominions, spiritual powers, and authorities. So your choice. Do you want to be an orphan or do you want to be adopted into the family of God? I'll start with the easy questions. What's your choice? Orphan or adopted in the family? Thank you. Do you want religion or a relationship? Yeah, see, you're getting it, okay? So we heard this earlier during prayer. James didn't know I was going to use this verse. Verse 15 in John 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. But I've called you, come on. You believe it? That Jesus is your friend? But what if he knows this? What if he knows that? He wouldn't want me to be his friend. He knows. <laughs> he knows. He still wants to be your friend, unlike people. <laughs> But I've called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father. I've made known to you the truth compass. Your Father is the truth compass. I'm here to show you how to do it. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Oh, hard to understand. Nobody else wanted to choose me. I'm a Scythian. Why would you choose me? It doesn't make sense. My way is different than your way. My kingdom operates on a different set of laws than yours does. Don't ask me why I chose you. Just believe that I did choose you. Because the world's been waiting to see who I made you to be, not who the world has turned you into. And there's a real you hanging out on the inside there that's just waiting to come out. But all held back by all the lies and, and all the ropes that have been tied around you, he came to set that captive free and release the real you into your destiny in God. Nothing could be better. Not only that you should go and bear fruit, but that your fruit should remain. <laughs> so you know the verse. It says, I lay in Zion a sure foundation of stone. And it says the builders rejected the cornerstone, right? That's where this comes from. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he says, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, Pharisees, and given to people who will tend its sweet fruit. Look around. That's what we're supposed to be doing, church, okay? We're supposed to be tending the sweet fruit of the kingdom of God and finding ways to get through problems and pressing in, fast, pray, read the word, study it so that when that person comes up to you in church and needs an answer, you're ready because we need each other and we're all going to operate at a different level and communicate differently. So be ready. It might not be your turn to receive any certain day. It might be your turn to give an answer that day. It's awesome to, to know that God is using you. So who's, the ones that he's going to bless are the ones who are willing to tend the sweet fruit of his kingdom. And then he says, he who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and on whom the stone falls will be crushed. That sounds like a really severe verse, doesn't it? But don't forget now, it was about the cornerstone. And they rejected Jesus. They said he can't be the one. But if you kneel down on that rock, if you fall on the rock... It's better than the rock falling on you. And that's what was going to happen to the Pharisees and the city of Jerusalem was going to be torn down because they missed their day of visitation. Big problem. How many don't want to miss your day of visitation? No thank you. No thank you. The door's open. I have to step through it. Don't have all the answers yet? It's all right. You know it's the Lord. Step through it. John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches. James said this earlier. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Awesome good fruit because a bad tree can't produce good fruit so if you're producing fruit when you're abiding in Jesus that's good fruit without me Dave Torres you could do nothing not me Peter the truth compass I'm almost done I'm gonna go faster enter by the narrow gate all right so wow enter by the narrow gate like so much goes into that one little quick phrase that you're going to have th thousands of choices of what you could do. But if you'll wait and listen for the Lord, he'll show you of all those 360 degrees, which slice you're supposed to go in. But many of us have just gotten so conditioned to operate off our emotions and, and, and what the right thing to say on Facebook is so I get more likes instead of what you really think. Selah. The narrow gate. Is, is harder to find because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many go to that one because the narrow gate, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. Mm. 
And these are, there are few who find it now. It doesn't say it's impossible, but it says it's going to take some concentration. It's going to take some intentionality. And this could be right down to the conversation you have in the break room when you go get a cup of coffee, right? Like we think that our guard, it's okay to let our guard down once in a while. No, you could be entertaining angels. Sometimes with the food at the company I work for, I was hoping there'd be some angels in there because the food wasn't very good that they gave you. <laughs> Could be the lady behind the counter. Could be any the guy at the gas station. God wants you to speak into them, but but your guard is down because it's not a hyped up service. Well, there's no no such thing as a hyped up service. That's all man's efforts to try to try to create something. Remember when Elijah was coming down on the prophets of Baal? Go ahead, say it a little louder. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe you can wake him up if you shout louder. No, there's nothing hyped up about Jesus. He's the most relaxed guy in the whole Bible. Because he knew his father and he trusted him. Okay, I'm, I'm done here. It's, it's, I'm finishing. It leads to life. And there are a few who are to find it. But you have all found it in one degree that you found the narrow road. And you walked through and said, yes, I'm going to accept Jesus. I don't fully understand how it's going to impact every area of my life. But I want that truth compass. I want my father in heaven and Jesus as my role model and the Holy Spirit to be the energy inside me. And somehow or another, I'm going to end off way better off if I do that. Then if I go the way the world wants me to go, this is the last portion. First Peter 2, it says, what credit, David Torres, picking on you because you're in the front row today, what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? And Megan's going, yeah, right. Had a reason. But when you do good and you suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Anybody else have a problem with this verse? Like, are we sure about this translation? Like, what do you mean, do good and suffer? I got to demand my rights. Maybe you have to give up your right to be right in order to be the witness that you need to be to let that other person see that you got something different than they do, right? <laughs> if you take it patiently, this is commendable for God. For this, to this you were called. What? Wait a minute. To what was I called? That I was going to have to do good and suffer and take it patiently? To this you were called? That's what it says. Verse 20, verse 21. I was called to do good and suffer. Truth compass. I need a ruling here. Is that what you meant? Well, look, you know, he said, don't slap back if somebody slaps you. Don't slap back. You ever wonder about that one? Well, maybe because when people are hostile, they only know one way of doing things. And when they yell at you and they slap you figuratively, what are they expecting? <laughs> roar, lion, roar. That's not what Brandon Lake's talking about. Right? What if you don't yell back? What if you disengage them because you're not engaging in the argument and you're just saying, wow, you must be really having a hard day. Because that's not the you that I really know. Maybe we can talk tomorrow because you're upset about whatever it is. Sorry, if it was me, I'm sorry, right? There's a lot to this. If you can hang in there and reflect the Father in the middle of that conversation, they don't know how to handle that. And there's a truth in there that they're going to be hungry to find. Exactly Trisha's story when she was being witnessed to in her job as an unbeliever. Exactly her story. They were bugging her and bugging her, and then she was seeing changes happening in people, and it didn't fit the narrative that she was given by the world. She could tell it better than I can. But she saw the changes and knew the changes were real. So if you fail to engage at the hostile level, they're engaging you at the spiritual level. And they know there's some different fuel inside of you. And I'll, this is the last part here. It says, for who? And Jesus, right? We sh he suffered. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his truth compass steps. Who, when he was reviled, did not slap back. When he was slapped... He didn't slap back. It doesn't mean be a wimp and don't defend yourself. It's figurative. It's about the way you respond in a different spirit because there's a different spirit living in you that actually could look at people and see them as sheep without a shepherd. Harassed and helpless is how it says about Jesus. When he looked at them, he had compassion and saw them as harassed and helpless. You got people like that in your life? Stand up. Say yes. You have some people in your life that look like they're harassed and helpless. And I don't think God put you there for some random reason. 
He puts you there to be a positive impact for the kingdom. Amen? Kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent are forcefully advancing, is the way the NIV says it, too. Forcefully advancing. Not by physical force, but by love. Whatever that means, you got to interpret it in every one of your own situations. And this verse ends in a really powerful way that could really be a prayer. When Jesus was screamed at, when he was reviled, when they struck him on the way to the cross, he could have called down a legion of angels. That's exactly what he said to Pontius Pilate. You have no authority unless my father had given you this authority. You're not taking my life. I'm voluntarily given my life as a sacrifice. Even Pilate's wife said, don't have anything to do with this guy. I had a dream about him. He didn't listen. Wives, look at your husbands. Say, Selah. He should have listened. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously, his truth compass, his father. So if we could just lift our hands, that, that's how I would want to end it today. And just say, Lord, it's a confusing world. And when I don't know what to do, I want to come into your sanctuary so that my distorted perspective gets straightened out, so that you can make the crooked way straight. There's so many confusing things happening in the world, but if I'll stick to the truth compass of the word and your spirit and, and recognize you as a loving father who's always willing to hear me when I come and ask a question, Lord, I ask you to give me the strength to do this right here, that I won't threaten, but I will commit that situation into your hands. A father, God, who judges righteously, because in my own strength, I'm not going to do it as well as you would, but you in me is going to get the best outcome possible. So could you just ask him right now, fill me, Lord, with your more of your spirit for the everyday things that I do, to teach me kingdom principles, and mostly to see you as my truth compass in Jesus' name. Amen.